beauty of your work is that you tackle fundamental questions and address basic precepts of economics in ways that are unique. So let me ask you a couple of questions about that. You said on several occasions that exchange rates are determined in part by the level of income in countries. Now, it's clear that changes in income levels, which are changes in productivity, uh, affect exchange rates. And maybe that's what you mean. But spell out a little more clearly why you make the stark statement that levels of income are key determinants of exchange rates. That actually comes not from me, but from Balasa Samuelson, where in both of them, in separate papers in 1964, um, there was a big controversy in, 19, in the early 60s that the US dollar was vastly overvalued. And they found out that, and it was the, the magnitudes uh, that were offered uh, by many uh, experts was something like 20 to 30 percent that the US dollar was overvalued. And independently, both Belasa and Samuelson then went into depth on this, empirically estimated in the case of Belasa, uh, and showed that, listen, if you adjust for, and I'll come to what you adjust for, basically the, their result was that the US dollar was very fairly valued against Japan, against Europe, etc. Matter of fact, uh, against Japan, they found that the dollar was within 1% of their valuation on both sides. And then the explanation was offered. So from Balasa's side, it was a very, very empirical uh, study. From Samuelson's side, as you would expect, it was a very, very theoretical study and went into this entire thing of uh, relative price levels are a function of uh, non-tradables versus tradables. And the US had a much larger share of non-tradables than uh, other countries and growth in those, et cetera. And therefore, its real exchange rate uh, was much higher than what, well, its equilibrium real exchange rate was higher than what you would think for the case of Japan, which had a more lower share of non-tradables. Now, from there, the, the productive, in terms of changes, and indeed, one of the important effects in my study is how exchange rate, real exchange rate changes affect growth. And that's a very straightforward one. That if I, productivity is going up faster than yours, uh, let's say your productivity is going up at 5%, my productivity is going up by 10%, then <clears throat> get us parables, basically price levels should decline by 5% in my country relative to your country. And that means a five, that is literally equivalent to a 5% appreciation in my exchange, in my real exchange. Okay, well some may want to ask questions about that. In fact, maybe I'll just go to those if you want to, no, not on that, okay. Um, so we'll put that one aside for a second. Uh, you also made, I think, a unique argument that the world moved from, I think you said, average currency undervaluation mm -hmm. of 10% or so 20 years ago, whatever your base, mm. to now average undervaluation. And again, the question is kind of a conceptual one. How can there be an average overvaluation or undervaluation? If somebody's undervalued, somebody else is overvalued, so how come it doesn't net to zero? What do you mean by a world average overvaluation or undervaluation? Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is, again, was looked at in a related context with current account balances uh, by um, um, uh, the IMF, and I'm trying to remember where, um, and I refer to that. Basically, the world is in balance. So how do you establish that the current account in the world is in balance because somebody's savings is netted by uh, somebody else's dis savings? So how do you establish that? And then what they did was, let's just look at the at the positive side, those people who have uh, current account uh, surpluses, etc. So logically, they, so there are methods by which this can happen. Logically, I take your point that, listen, the average valuation level in the world has to be zero. Um, and therefore, I would think that these are changes which are, and they're not in equilibrium. And I think your point refers to more that thing in equilibrium, you will not happen. This will not happen. 
but we are not in equilibrium. And therefore, these are transition stages towards that equilibrium, which is given by zero, just like you know, previously it was 10% overvalued. That could happen. And now we are 10% undervalued. That can't happen. And I accept that. But it is to suggest that and, you know, there are measurement errors, uh, if you will, etc. But broadly, if you look at each individual country, and after all, this is a weighted average, uh, so each individual country, you do get that they are depreciating by this measure. Now, I do not know of any measure that shows that everything is always at the world aggregate level zero. There is no measure of currency undervaluation that will show that result. So and the only defense I have is mine are much more reasonable. That is, the other measures show a magnitude of minus 30, etc. And uh, this one, if you will, is close to zero. OK, uh, with that as backdrop, and if that didn't lose too many people, uh, we'll open it up. Uh, will, please identify yourself. We've got a traveling mic. We've got a standing mic in the back. Go to one or the other, identify yourself, and fire away. Uh, uh, will Martin from World Bank. Thanks very much for a really interesting presentation. Book looks really interesting. Um, I came along hoping for an answer to a question that's been troubling me. If you have a depreciation, um, how is it that that depreciation alone is going to change the current account balance, which is the difference between income and expenditure or savings and investment? Mm -hmm. um, and this has always troubled me because I've always been, you know, uh, the swan, the salter argument requires changes both the switching and the balance between income and expenditure. Um, but just on a quick look at your book, um, I found something else that uh, intrigued me. So uh, my second question actually is, um, if you have a devaluation, and if that stimulates investment, and if saving stays the same, then a devaluation is going to change the income expenditure and the current account balance, but it's going to make it worse. You're going to expand investment relative to saving. So, um, I'm still left not understanding how devaluation changes the balance between income and expenditure, or if it does, um, how come it doesn't create a current account deficit rather than a surplus? Yeah. Hope, I hope you can clarify for us. Yeah. No, taking backwards from there, I mean, it depends, if you will, what the effect is on savings, what the effect is on investment, and they can be different, okay? And they can be different for different countries. Related. And I do present estimates of what the uh, effect is on an aggregate basis uh, for, for savings as well as investment and as well as growth as well as total factor productivity growth. So the effects can be different and you can get that. I think I, what I read in from your first part as to how much it goes in here or there is that there are examples of where you can have by this measure um, a currency can be undervalued and yet have a current account deficit, and a currency can be overvalued and yet have a current account surplus because there are other determinants, uh, savings behavior, cultural factors, whatever you have, that there are other determinants of the current account surplus or current account deficit than just the exchange rate. And therefore, you can have multiple solutions. Now, in the aggregate, actually, the empirical, uh, on an empirical basis, each 10% depreciation of the exchange rate helps the current account move by 0.4 percentage points of GDP. Now, in the case of the US, the effect is much larger. And actually, um, maybe, you know, how do I get the US measure is by the negative of the, just to solve the circle, that every country, the undervaluation is measured with respect to the PPP dollar, including the US. And I then get the estimate of the US uh, real exchange rate and therefore equilibrium exchange rate or whatever you want to call it as a weighted negative average of its trading partner's undervaluation. But you can get multiple uh, solutions because there are other factors also impinging. All right, but let's stick with this for a minute and hoping it doesn't lose too many people because for us exchange rate aficionados, this is really a central point. Will's first statement is the way in which many macroeconomists respond to questions about exchange rate changes. How could an exchange rate change have any effect on a current account 
because the current account is determined by the difference between saving and investment, and the exchange rate change doesn't say anything about saving or investment. Well, of course, the answer is the exchange rate change does affect both saving and investment. But as Will said, the implication of what you argue is that it will push saving up more than investment. In some cases, for some countries, it might do that. For some other countries, it may do the opposite. Because, so, because you don't believe depreciation always promotes surpluses. No. I, so my linkage is, and I'll answer that very specifically, my linkage first and foremost is from exchange rate change to investment. And there's a whole, if you will, outline of a model as the profitability of investment. And the profitability of investment goes up, Keteris Paribus, when there is a depreciation in the real exchange rate, which means there's a depreciation, there's a lowering of costs. And this is all an international market. So therefore, if I lower my costs in real terms compared to a worker in the US or compared to a worker in China, it, it's the same because everything is on that. So that's the foremost conclusion, if you will, or the most important, and that's why I don't go to growth being affected or current account being affected by the real exchange rate, but I do go to the investment being affected. Savings is in fact is affected as follows, that if I have, and this actually, not to bore you with, but this goes back literally to my PhD thesis, where savings was a function of the growth in income, completely contrary to the permanent income hypothesis as well as the life cycle hypothesis. And there I argued that basically both empirically and theoretically, your transitory, when you're growing fast, your transitory income is increasing as a fraction of your total income and therefore you have a tendency to save more of it. And therefore your savings rate goes up. Apart from the fact that there is a level of the, the you know, savings rate all then converge, again, it's, I guess I've been obsessed with sort of S-shaped relationships for developed countries, you don't have a change in the savings rate, uh, regardless of how much the transitory income goes up or down on a large, on a, on a, on a, on a time series basis. You can have deviations every year. Um, but in countries like India, developing countries, and you know, here, if I can take an aside, there was a dictum of Sir Arthur Lewis, and I, you know, really, I, I'm in awe of him. Uh, and his work, and particularly theory of economic growth, but as, as well as unlimited supplies of labor. But, you know, there was a statement in his book, uh, early book, 1955, that when a country moves from a 5% savings rate to a 12% savings rate, we can consider it developed. And history tells us that he was way off uh, in terms that he, nobody thought in the 60s, remember the Asian drama came out then. Nobody thought that you know Asia would grow, or countries would grow much above, if you will, two or three percent, and uh, you know, and savings rate in the 30s and 40s. So, I don't know if that's a. No, a, I think I mean this is very important. This is a, it's a plausible story that currency depreciation leads to more investment, leads to more growth, yeah. which leads to more saving at a rate faster than the pickup yeah. in initial investment, yeah. and therefore external surplus. So, but that's a very important response to the many economists who will say currency change doesn't affect anything, so why do you guys care about it? Okay, we got a lot of hands. Joe Gagne has a sort of two-hander here. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, Sergey, can I add one point? I, I actually agree with that story that, that, that you and Fred just mentioned, and you said that countries have different uh, cases, but isn't one important case among this that uh, some of these governments are also doing the saving for people like by putting the money abroad, right? That's that's the currency manipulation. That's, that's one of the ways they get the overvalue, uh, undervaluation. And uh, because capital isn't really that mobile, not fully mobile between countries, they're allowed, they can still keep saving high domestically by keeping a high interest rate. In other words, the the uh, there's a bit of more independence of your domestic monetary policy from your exchange rate policy, which allows you to keep a high interest rate domestically to, to keep saving domestic high while the government does the yeah. like abroad. Yes? Is that, is that so, no, no, I, actually, uh, that is, I, I think, an, an important addition to the argument. And the reason 
there is government savings. Uh, we had exchange rate is there intervening uh, in preventing the exchange rate from appreciation. So, yeah. Okay, uh, Roger. So I've always stressed, Roger Kvarich from the NIC, I've always stressed the redistributional effects of devaluations and appreciations. And why shouldn't there be major shifts, for example, as we have seen in, uh, say, middle class real incomes relative to upper class middle incomes, which would lead to very differential savings behavior and, and you would see it. The one thing that in the story that I don't buy is the absence of institutional effects in terms of the budget constraint on people and on companies. And what we have seen in this last 10 or 15 years uh, was a massive change in the institutional structure of financial uh, sector that allowed for enormous leveraging all over the place. And uh, we know what all that led to. <laughs> and, the, um, and the savings rate, of course, in the US dipped negative for a while because of this easy availability of credit. Uh, we don't have negative savings rates all the time anymore, but it's still pretty low, even though the, uh, uh, what you say, access to credit has gone down. But it seems to me that's a much more powerful effect uh, on macro economies and certainly for all the industrial countries uh, than anything else. And exchange rates move all over the place, but we had this essentially a s experiment of a once for all explosion of uh, credit availability and now a once for all uh, sort of deleveraging process. So well, that's institutional. I mean, that, the, the ability of the financial system to do all that was because of changes in basically attitudes of regulators, uh, laws, and so on. Uh, and that's really powerful. All I would say on that is that what you'd mentioned earlier is something that I have uh, done a lot of work on and we supports what I think you were saying in terms of the middle class and the development of the middle class is a huge influence on savings, on investment and on growth. The other part is while applicable to the developed economies and certainly applicable um, that at this stage it's not that important for the economies that I've been I've considered the developing economies. Uh, where, but I think what you may be pointing to, and I have no reason to disagree, that unless we get our regulation function right, that we will face the same problems uh, that the West has faced. Uh, John Williamson. Uh, in your, in initiating your remarks, you uh, remarked on the importance of uh, getting the currency values right. And there you pointed to a large number of cases of currencies that were previously overvalued. It's quite clear that they were overvalued. And every single case was overvalued. What you, what you said in the remarks um, was that 10% uh, increasing undervaluation by 10% was as good as decreasing overvaluation by 10%. And it's that which I deny, and which I think is the basis of our agreement. Um, and I want to give you, uh, want to hear from you a single extra case cited other than China. I mean, China, it's true that an undervaluation in China was helpful because the, the countervailing force which naturally comes in is the ability to make the investments that you say increase. Um, well, if you, uh, the problem with devaluing is that you uh, create uh, an ability inability to finance investments in the greater scale as you would otherwise. And it's that which is a natural limitation. So I want to hear some other country besides China cited explicitly. Uh, I can tell you the example of the East Asian countries other than China, the ones that were victims of the crisis of 1997. In each case, they switched resources out of the balance of payments, uh, out of, I'm sorry, out of investment into the balance of payments. Uh, they also switched from consumption to balance of payments, but that was not, by and large, no lesser extent, um, in response to the crisis. And in each case, they got a low growth rate in consequence. 
And it's your theory which indicates they also have had a high birth rate. The, the birth rates fell at these stage by about 3% a year on average. Yeah. And I want you to yeah. tell me exactly how you yeah. uh, reconcile One. this example with your theory. Okay. If I understand, I mean, one country's undervaluation is another country's overvaluation. And the Thai crisis, uh, the East Asian crisis in 97-98, as I argue, was preceded by the fact that basically, much like the tier two economies lost competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis Germany and therefore the rest of the world, the East Asian economies lost a large amount of competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis China. And therefore, their currencies became overvalued. Then, if you will, there's empirical estimates, India, Vietnam, Korea. I, I think there are more examples, and that's what I try and document in the book, that there are plenty of examples um, where, if you will, undervaluation has helped growth. And there's chapter and verse given, and maybe we can discuss later, but I just find, and take the US and China in the most recent crisis, uh, the U.S. was overvalued, China was undervalued. So I don't know, we can't, I, at least I don't think we can speak in partial terms uh, of one currency's undervaluation, which goes back to the earlier point, that the aggregate level has to be zero or broadly the same. So, uh, uh, Barry and Joe Marie, and then up here. Barry Wood from Hong Kong Radio. Does it follow from your analysis that Greece would be better off to get out of the euro, to devalue, devalue to prosperity, or at least out of crisis? Secondly, what's an appropriate exchange rate for the dollar euro? What's the appropriate exchange rate for? Dollar euro. OK. <laughs> um, OK, let me answer the second question first. Um, I'll, I'll just give you my direct view. Um, I think there's no question that Keter's parables, Greece will be better off with its own exchange rate uh, and a heavily depreciated one. Uh, but I have, you know, the, the entire concept of, so I'm very much in favor of the entire concept of Europe and therefore of a unified exchange rate and the entire idea of Europe. So, I, I'm saying that while, and, and, and I think the transition as a market player, the transition to now dismantling the currency system in Europe uh, can have prohibitive costs uh, to the rest of us, even those in India, etc. Then the, the second question of um, what is a fair value of the euro uh, with respect to um, uh, the dollar, and the estimate I think I get in the book is that on an aggregate basis, which includes all the currencies uh, of, um, of Europe weighted by their output and so on and so forth, that the euro is overvalued by about 15% or 20%. So that says it should depreciate to something like one to one against the dollar. I think in my, one of the drafts, I did put that in. And then I took it out because it seemed outlandish. And this was, if you will, before the crisis really hit. But it is exactly, approximately about one. And it, it seemed like a great idea to have it unity. And that's what the numbers show. But, you know, it's, it is, if you will, that's, I believe, one of the few theoretical uh, exercises because I don't think we can, um, you know, get there. But, Anyway, but I answer your question, that's the number in the text. Just as an aside, uh, there are some economists in this country now who are arguing for a big depreciation of the euro uh, along those lines uh, in order to essentially bail out the tier two countries. Yeah, yeah. Uh, essentially arguing that the euro should be uh, reflecting not the average of the Eurozone economies, but the weakest. Because if you're going to put maintenance of the Eurozone above all other objectives, and I'm optimistic and positive on that too, uh, you may have to countenance, a, but they would say substantially undervalued Euro in terms of the average, yeah. recognizing that this would enable Germany, already the world's largest surplus country, to have 
even much bigger surpluses and then exacerbate the imbalances you talk about. I don't, I, Marty Feldstein takes that view. I was with him on a program last week and he used to say the euro was terrible, it should blow up. Now he says, well, that would be too costly, but we have to let the euro go back to something like parity with the dollar in order to rescue Italy, Spain, the southern tier. Um, to me, that would be so disruptive for the world economy because That's of right, the implied yeah. overvaluation then for the U.S. and everybody else. It's a bad idea. But, it, uh, but that is a view that's now beginning to get some, uh, some currency. There's an easier solution, and that is German wages. I mean, it's a win-win situation. German wages should rise by about 20% relative to other countries, and we'll soon get to a better world. But uh, We need an internal revaluation yeah. of uh, the German economy. Exactly. Okay, uh, Joe Marie. Thank you, Jill Marie Grease Grabber with New Rules for Global Finance. This is kind of a simple historical question. If looking at the 1930s and the problems of, of devaluation and beggaring by neighbor were all taught was just the absolute evil and you had to have the Bretton Woods Conference to counteract that, and now you're saying we don't need, we need more devaluation, why don't we just shut down the IMF? Because that was its purpose. Okay. I I, I certainly didn't want to get. I would put you I, out of a job, Joe. <laughs> I know. I know. There, there's a whole, and I would, if if you do get uh, to read the book, uh, that after chapter one, you should read chapter 14, where I do give uh, my answer to that thing, um, to your to your question in particular, um, that you know, because now that we are vastly more integrated world, and this. Uh, applies a lot more today than it did 20, 30 years ago, that you cannot have these individual beggar thy neighbor policies. And we have seen, and it is indeed there's a chapter where I developed the concept of how do you measure whether a country is mercantilist or not and the degree of mercantilism. Uh, but that's basically what has allowed the system to go to. The IMF uh, punishes or Polices uh, countries that have a current account deficit, but does nothing when they have a current account surplus. And a lot of economists, including those at Peterson Institute, have talked about the inadequacy of the IMF's existing rules. So I'm not, you know, I think, as I said, there's a double play on devaluing to prosperity. Yes, for an individual country, it is beneficial, but only if the rest of the world allows you to get away with it. And now, the rest of the world, given the example, why is it that we don't think about, or really, we wouldn't be thinking about it if there wasn't a large player? You know, Singapore is undervalued, it's got current account surplus up to wazoo's, at, you know, 120% of GDP or some, some large number. Uh, and we don't really care. But we do care when China has a current account surplus of 8% of GDP. See, Joe Marie, just to add, I would draw the opposite conclusion, and it's implicit what Sergi said. What these issues suggest is not that we should abolish the IMF, but we should really beef it up. Moreover, because the IMF doesn't have any uh, enforcement powers, we should link it to the WTO. Because if you want to seriously strengthen the multilateral system, to provide deterrence against currency manipulation and competitive undervaluation, you're probably going to have to invoke the trade instrument to respond to the currency manipulation. Now, there is an article in the WTO which also, in vague terms, never implemented or even invoked, bars countries from essentially competitive exchange rate devaluation. And that all comes from, as you said, the lesson of the 1930s. But the paradox is that the Bretton Woods system, which was created to avoid replication of the competitive devaluation of 1930s, did not provide an effective instrument to cope with competitive devaluations. Indeed, it set up two silos. It set up an IMF that dealt with monetary issues and very explicitly prohibited competitive devaluation, but had no enforcement mechanisms. And over here, it created a trade institution, the GATT, now WTO, 
which also had a prohibition against currency undervaluation and did have enforcement mechanisms, namely trade controls, but deferred to the IMF in terms of determining the existence of a currency problem. And since the twain have never met because of institutional silos and because most national governments, notably our own, have at least as distinct silos, i.e., the Treasury does currency and the USDR does trade, and they seldom talk to each other, let alone cooperate, <laughs> you've got a huge gap in the middle of the global architecture, which to the extent one worries about the problems we have here, and Sergi talks about, and Joe and I have talked about very recently, we put our recent op-ed in your handout material, you have to say this is a massive failure of the international economic architecture. So what to do about that? Well, going forward, the lesson is link trade and finance. So the next time the US negotiates an FTA, like maybe the Trans-Pacific Partnership, does it need a currency clause? Well, Joe and I in our recent FT op-ed argue it does. Paul Volcker has always famously said, the changes in tariffs that take five years or 10 years to negotiate can be offset by 30 minutes of exchange rate movement, which is true. <laughs> so it defies logic, actually, to maintain this bifurcation between trade and currency. And creative, politically feasible, new ways need to be found to make those linkages, preferably at the multilateral international level. But since that's a pretty far cry, it's almost certainly going to have to be done at national levels first. Those of you with historical uh, minds will remember that the uh, benighted Nixon administration did it by linking its 71. imperative of getting a currency realignment for the dollar coming out of the Bretton Woods fixed rate system and using an import surcharge as the leverage for that purpose, and it worked. So the question is, what kind of hopefully more orderly way can be found? That's a big project here at the Institute. We're working on that in great, uh, in great depth and uh, hope to come up with some ideas. The difficulty, of course, is to find an answer to this, I think, unassailable economic policy problem that is politically feasible and which does not throw out the baby with the bathwater in the sense of raising more problems than it solves. But that's the trick, and that's what we try to do around here. So we're working hard on that. But I think it's undeniable that this is a major, major systemic problem, not to mention the adverse effects on the economies adversely affected. And parenthetically, I have argued that the US is the country most adversely affected. And the reason is the dollar is the residual currency, the nth currency in in international monetary theory, where everybody else sets its currency by intervention in the dollar. The US is passive, and that's a systemic rule, though never explicitly signed up by the US, but that's the way the system works. So when China manipulates to keep the RMB undervalued, it does so by buying dollars. I've said the logical thing for the US is to countervail by buying renminbi. It's a technical problem. There aren't as many renminbi around as you'd like. But when we worried about the yen, that would have been a perfectly reasonable response. The, dollar, the US could have bought as many yen as the Japanese bought dollars, offset their intervention, and thereby negate the manipulation. Now, that's hardball. But in the absence of alternative strategies, what do you do if you worry about it? But I would argue the US is the most adversely affected. But lots of other developing countries, and Sergi has said that, are adversely affected too. Uh, because they're essentially defenseless against countries like China, which do uh, substantially undervalue their currency. The other key thing, and this was the point of Joe's recent uh, uh, analysis, our policy brief on that, which comes to similar conclusions but from a different analytical standpoint, is that it's not just China, that there are at least a dozen fairly major countries, including Switzerland, including oil exporters, which do exactly the same thing, competitively undervalue their currencies, so that if you're going to 
make an attack on this issue, you're going to want to be broader than just China. On the one hand, that's helpful by not singling out China and making it a China bashing exercise. On the other hand, it's more difficult because then you're fomenting an alliance of the manipulators uh, to oppose the guys who are adversely affected by the manipulation, uh, which includes, incidentally, the Eurozone as well as the United States. But this is a huge systemic problem, as well as one that Joe and I at least argue, and Sergi clearly agrees, has big implications for national economies. Now, the way Joe and I put it in our recent piece is that this has been the most overlooked reason for sluggish U.S. growth and continuing high unemployment. And we put it deliberately that way because we think it's very big. It has not been addressed by this or any other administration. Uh, there have been some noises in the Congress and the business community about it, but it's still been a very uh, sotto voce kind of thing because, as John Connolly said, the manicured playing fields of international finance uh, are not to be trifled with. And it maybe it takes a John Connolly to do that. But these are big, big unsolved problems, and uh, Sergi's book goes very much down that line. Okay, there have been a couple of other hands right here and then over to. Uh, two quick questions. Please Homie, Homie, Homie Karas from Brookings. Um, you started to talk about uh, crises, and uh, there had been a lot of theories about multiple equilibria, about speculative runs, etc. But I seem to hear you basically saying that currency crises, by and large, can all be expressed by fundamentals. Uh, and I just wanted to know if that was accurate or not. And second, I wonder if you can expand a little bit on the implications of these ideas for capital controls. For implications cap for cap cap Capital controls. Okay. Um, well, intervention of the kind exercised by most developing countries is a form of capital control. And indeed, I, let me link it with, um, so therefore, you know, otherwise, if you had a, a freely floating exchange rate uh, and no intervention from any side, currencies will overshoot, will adjust rather quickly uh, in whatever direction that the fundamentals of the moment determine it to be, uh, which are also affected by expectations of growth, etc. So, you know, one fundamental that and which I address in in quite big detail in the book is the assumption that, listen, the, if you change the nominal exchange rate, which is all that you're trying to do, a country is trying to do, how can you affect a real variable? Um, and the argument has been, and there is a legion of authors on that, is that if I intervene and keep my currency cheap, basically excess inflation will come to be and that will negate any influence that I might have had. I might have had an influence for one year, maybe two years, but very quickly um, that influence will disappear and excess inflation will occur and you will not have any advantage. Um, and this, you know, I examined for several countries, uh, an aggregate of countries, by regions, etc., is just not, has, has not happened. There's nothing wrong with the theory that, listen, you cheapen your goods and there will be excess demand and so on and so forth. So I think, you know, countries, policymakers have learned their lesson. And, you know, some great examples is, is the UK, forget a developing country, Great Britain uh, devalued with respect to the, uh, to the Deutsche Mark um, and in 1992 by something like 30% and didn't have excess inflation of the amount indicated by that. So I think, you know, fund, when you say that, I'm not saying fundamentals determine exchange rates. I don't know whether you said that, but um, they are obviously an important factor. And I think, you know, countries can influence various real activity by intervening in the exchange rate, just like as I think, and uh, not put an aside, that like they can influence real activity by influencing uh, the level of the interest rate. Uh, and that again, if you have free capital flows, then what interest rate I set will not be material. 
uh, because I can borrow from abroad and so on and so forth. But it doesn't happen. And India is one striking example of where we've had very high real interest rates and not surprisingly very low growth. So to answer your question, um, you can, real variables matter that uh, we are not in, in Kansas and we never were, where everything is floating and everything equilibrates uh, and uh, countries can therefore gain and lose advantage by their policies. Final question. Um, I thought it was very significant. Um, Pat Malloy, I teach uh, trade law at Catholic University Law School. And one, I agree absolutely with what Fred laid out here, because this is, this is a huge political problem now. And in the United States, we're, we're destroying the consensus for globalization and free trade because workers understand something bad is happening to them, and it's a rigged game. And this is part of the rigging. Now, I want to, you, you point out that China's currency is actually more undervalued now than it was 10 years ago because of productivity gains have been factored in. Fred, rather than um, just wait politically, why don't we push the United States government to bring that WTO case under Article 15.4 of the WTO Charter? There is actually a precedent in the, in the, in the WTO where India put on some restraints, and then the WTO asked the IMF for its opinion on whether this was uh, something feasible or should. And so there is a precedent for the WTO to look to the IMF and get its guidance. Of course, that means we have to work the IMF a lot better to make it tell the truth about what is going on here. Well, as, you, as I think you know, I've been testifying to Congress for at least three or four years now that exactly that is what U.S. policy should do, should take China to the WTO under that article. Uh, the USTR lawyers have argued that we wouldn't win the case uh, because the article is so vague. I have said, take it anyway. If you don't win the case, when the economics of it is so obvious, it would then show the clear need to reform. It didn't make your case wrong. Well, exactly. So, but the U.S. government, in its wisdom, has chosen quiet <laughs> diplomacy with the Chinese rather than uh, the confrontation that would be implied. Uh, and I think if the U.S. were to do it, it should try to line up as broad a coalition of the willing as possible, i.e., the many other countries that are adversely affected by the manipulation by China and other countries uh, who taken together add up to at least as much impact as China. When you put together the remainder of the list that at least Joe and I have, it's a bit broader than Sergi's, although there's some overlap, but if you put together our list, the rest of them added up have as much economic impact as China, big as it is. So it would be a broader issue, and there are a lot of countries hurt. So if the U.S. were to get serious about it, it would then try to organize a coalition that would take the case to the WTO. So it was not just the U.S. unilaterally. The Europeans certainly should be on board. A number of emerging markets and developing countries should be on board. Whether they would stand up and call a spade a spade in the China case, Hard to say, but that would be the test, and that goes back to the basic point. There's a huge systemic gap. What, oh, sir? Last word. Yeah. No, I just wanted, you know, uh, one question that a lot of us are well plagued with or need uh, want to give an answer to is to how much um, by the uh, Chinese undervaluation or Japanese undervaluation or whichever. Um, how much does it affect the growth of others? So is that a zero-sum game? And Homi and I have discussed this a lot, and I, you know, um, so I try to come up uh, literally to a, an empirical answer to that. And what is interesting, and that's reported in the book, is that if you have the uh, U.S. Uh, dollar as the numerator, its changes don't impact the world. If you have the euro, it doesn't impact the world. If you have China's uh, undervaluation level, that affects the growth rate of other countries. Now, it's an attempt at, a, if you will, empirical explanation, as I said, prompted by Homie's uh, intervention earlier, much earlier. Um, and I'm just throwing it out. This is, you know, it does come out statistically very strong that Chinese growth rate subtracts 
the growth rate or is is China's growth rate is higher and other countries' growth rate is lower, unlike any other exchange rate, any other major economy exchange rate. Well, Sergey, thank you. Uh, as always, you've been creative and provocative. We thank you for the book. We thank you for the presentation. We look forward to continuing to discuss it with you, and uh, I'm delighted we've done the project together. And thank you all for coming. Meeting adjourned.